Hi, this is Professor of Photography Jeff Curto, and welcome to the 15th and final class session of History of Photography. The 15th class session looks at two seemingly divergent topics, conceptual photography and first documentary photography, looking at the photograph as a document of events and places and people, and then also looking at uh, the world of conceptual image making. And in fact, we try to draw a few parallels between these two divergent paths. So here we are joining our class in progress. Today's topic, photograph as document, concept as photograph. Two separate topics that uh, in some ways kind of come together a little bit, uh, talking about documentary photography first and then uh, toward the end, conceptual photography. Uh, and then at the very end, I'll have a little bit of some closing thoughts to kind of see if we can tie all of this up in a nice, neat package. So as you know, I like to bring in uh, books that, uh, that relate to photography's history or relate to the criticism of photography. This is a really interesting book called Each Wild Idea. It's written by a guy named Jeffrey Batchen. Uh, it's a book from 2002. Uh, and the subtitle of the book, which nobody could possibly read because it's really small there, uh, is uh, Writing Photography History. Each Wild Idea, Writing Photography History. And in this book, Batchen tries to answer this question. When is a photograph made? And so he says in his book, when is a photograph made? At what points in its production should we locate it in its creative and temporal boundaries? When is it, or is it when the photographer depresses the camera's shutter release, submitting a chosen scene to the stasis of framed exposure? Is it when the photographer singles out this exposure for printing, thereby investing a latent image with the personal significance of selection, labor, and most crucial of all, visibility? Or is it when that image is first exposed to the public gaze, the moment when, if only by adding itself to a culture's visual collective archive, the photograph could be said to enact some sort of residual effect? All right? So that quotation is from a chapter entitled Taking and Making. Taking and Making. And when Batchen is uh, in that chapter talking about the differences between photographs that are found and photographs that are created, and as how, how as time passes, the meaning of images is altered. It's certainly something that we've seen over and over again uh, throughout our time together this semester. Batchen also talks about the choices photographers make, both before and after they find or create their subjects, and how those choices affect the outcome of the photograph in visual ways and also in intellectual ways. So today's class deals with these two divergent paths in photography's history. The documentary image that takes something that exists and records it, and the conceptual photograph, something that uh, talks about ideas behind the image. And we tried today to see if we can examine these two different things. But if we sort of remember that first thing that Batchen was asking us in his quote that I was reading you, thinking about the difference between when or thinking about the, the sort of making or the conception of a photograph. Is it when the photographer sees the subject? Is it when the photographer presses the shutter release button and makes a frame around something? Is it when the photographer chooses that picture out of their contact sheet of images, whether it's a physical darkroom contact sheet or a, a virtual contact sheet in Lightroom, and chooses that image to work on and print or otherwise put out into the public eye? Or is it when the public begins to look at that photograph? When is the photograph made? And that's part of what we're going to be uh, talking about today and seeing if we can find some answers to. So uh, first, let's see if we can kind of uh, talk about documentary photography and see if we can figure out what documentary photography is. So um, here is a definition, not the definition, but a definition of documentary photography. Photographs often but not always in a sequence or series that explore a subject in the way the public expects to be factual and accurate. <coughs> Documentary photographs may include various <coughs> viewpoints or they may be subjective, offering the viewpoint and impressions of one photographer. So let's sort of dissect that a little bit, see if we can kind of come up with something that we can understand a little bit more out of that. So documentary photographs 
are often in a sequence or series, so it's often something more than just a single picture. And there is an expectation on the part of the viewer that they are factual and accurate. So the public expects them to be factual and accurate. They might include various viewpoints. In other words, some people might uh, look at documentary photography as something that lots of people are looking at uh, this particular topic. Or they may be subjective, offering the viewpoint and impressions of just one person. And what's interesting about this is that these two things in some ways seem to be a little contradictory, don't they? In some ways it sort of suggests that while the public may, be, it may expect them to be factual and accurate, if they are subjective, they are the photographer's interpretation of whatever that thing is. So here are some questions that we could ask about documentary photographs, and, and we'll follow up in these photographers here at the bottom uh, as we go along. Some questions we can ask are who took the photograph? Why and for whom was the photograph taken? How was it taken? What can companion photographs that come alongside of it tell us? And I, one of the things I think is interesting is that these are all great questions to ask about documentary photographs. They might be really good questions to ask about just about any photograph. Really, when it comes right down to it, who took it, why and for whom, how, and what can companion photographs tell us? Uh, so uh, that's a kind of an interesting set of ideas. Uh, and why and for whom, that second bullet item, is one that I find really interesting because the photographer themselves may be the person involved in making that decision about making the photographs of that particular subject. But it could also be somebody has hired them to make photographs for some particular reason. So knowing that background may be a, uh, an important part. How, going back to some of the things we've talked about about technology and the implications of what kinds of technology were brought to bear on a particular subject, so how is the photograph taken? And then if there are any pictures that come alongside it, how do those pictures change our point of view? So early documentary photography, we won't spend a lot of time here because we've spent so much time already, but early documentary photography that traveled the world was intended to show people the facts of the world that had not yet been seen by huge numbers of people. Uh, distant parts of the globe, uh, and we've seen photographs from photographers who spanned that globe, bringing back evidence of the sites and peoples of distant exotic lands uh, from the east here uh, to the west. And as the world became more accessible, images became more important as a means of documenting what was out there. What in the world was the world about? What did the rest of the world look like? And remember that we've also drawn the parallel to suggest that one of the reasons for this was that Transportation was getting easier and better. It was easier and uh, more, more possible for more people to travel. And so people were becoming more and more interested in the sights and, and scenes of distant places. So Eugene, uh, Jean Eugene, Jean Eugene Auguste Adje, we usually just think of him as uh, Eugene Adje, uh, was among the first of photography's social documentarians, social documentarians. And he's come to be regarded as one of the medium's major figures. And we've sort of danced around him a couple of different times, but this is a great spot to spend a, a couple minutes with him. Uh, Eugene Atje's photographs of Paris are perhaps one of the most vivid records of any city that's ever been made by really any photographer. They are, of course, very romantic views of a city that Atje loved, but there are also something more. His images represent a methodical survey, a very methodical survey of a rapidly changing Paris. Eventually, Atje made over 10,000 photographs. 10,000 photographs for us in our digital era may not seem like that many, but in Atje's era of just after the turn of the century, uh, 19, the early 1900s, 10,000 photographs is a huge number of images. So he eventually made over 10,000 photographs of the city of Paris and its environs uh, over a 30-year time span. Um, Ansel Adams wrote about Eugene Atje in 1931. He said, the charm of Atje lies not in the mastery of the plates and papers of his time, nor in the quaintness of the costume, architecture, 
and humanity as revealed in his pictures, but in his equitable and intimate point of view. His work is a simple revelation of the simplest aspects of his environment. There's no superimposed symbolic motive, Adams goes on to say, no tortured application of design. He has no intellectual ax to grind. Ache's photographs are direct and emotionally clean records of a rare and subtle perception and represent perhaps the early exp earliest expression of true photographic art. So Adams says, you know, here's a guy who got what photography was about and that he had no tortured application of design, no intellectual acts to grind, no symbolic motive. He simply recorded what he saw, what he was interested in, what he thought was interesting to view. So Otje's Paris is part legend, part dream, but it's also very profoundly real, even in the most dreamlike of some of his photographs. Very profoundly real and very much a record of a particular place at a particular time, because of course, one of Otje's missions was to record Paris at a time when it was becoming a much more modern city. He loved the old Paris of his youth and wanted to record what that looked like. So as a document, they stand the test of time, not only photographically, but also because the Paris of Atje's time no longer exists. So another aspect of uh, uh, documentary photography is its worldview. Documents of newsworthy events also held the interest of both photographers and the public that viewed the pho photographs that photographers made. Uh, as we talked about when we looked at this photograph from uh, the Wright brothers' first flight some time ago, the event, any news event, was suspect unless there was a photograph to go along with it. Words no longer were sufficient to describe something that happened. Uh, pictures wanted uh, to be part of the, part of the, uh, the, the body of information. So that idea of the world view kind of morphs its way into a social conscience. When Jakob Rees, who was a reporter in New York uh, City, uh, a newspaper reporter, began his personal campaign to expose the misery of the underprivileged living in the crime-infested slums of New York's Lower East Side, he soon found that the printed word was not sufficiently convincing. So he turned to photography by flash exposure. Because what he recognized was that as people saw him setting up a camera in the daylight, they would begin to change the way they were. They weren't really as candid as subjects as they were at night when it wasn't possible for him to make photographs. So he began to use flash powder to illuminate these dark places uh, that he would find. Their purpose, the purpose of the photographs, as uh, Reese said, was to make a collection of views for lantern slides, the equivalent in the 19th century and early 20th century of what we're doing now, projected images. Uh, he wanted to make lantern slides to show, as he put it, as no mere description could, the misery and vice that I've noticed in my 10 years of experience of reporting uh, on the lives of these people. And I'd like to suggest a direction in which good might be done. In 1890, Reese published a book of this work. It was really one of the very first photographic books ever published called How the Other Half Lives, and it described the squalid conditions and the difficult situations that these people uh, were living in. Uh, and that book, How the Other Half Lives, in fact did help get some child labor laws changed, and some other uh, uh, social solutions to problems. So the direct, powerful, penetrating images that Reese made ended up doing some social good. Another photographer who used his social conscience uh, is Lewis Hine. Hine's documentation of child labor was instrumental in helping to get laws established that could help working children. Uh, and also, as we see on the image on the right, to give faces to the faceless multitudes who were coming ashore at Ellis Island. These thousands and thousands every day of immigrants coming to this country whose names were being changed at whim. You know, some of you probably even have that in your background of a name that isn't really the name that your ancestors came with. 
that somehow got changed at, uh, at Ellis Island. Uh, what's interesting is that Hein considered himself uh, a photographer, but first and foremost, he thought of himself as a social worker. A social worker. He also thought of himself as a reformer. A social worker, a reformer, and a photographer. Uh, and one critic, Alan Trachtenberg, wrote, uh, to be a straight photographer, straightforward photographer, for Hein meant more than purity of photographic means. It also meant a responsibility to the truth of his vision. So that nugget of truth, truth, moral sort of uh, uh, fortitude to tell the truth about a particular situation. Uh, so uh, Hein's photographs shamed America and helped bring about uh, some changes in labor laws uh, especially in some of these factories where kids were working. So we've looked at this picture a number of times throughout our time together, and of course you probably have noted that I've used it as a kind of touchstone for us, a place that we could always kind of come back to to find a kind of locus of understanding of photography's place in the world. And uh, one of the things that I hope you've seen as we've gone along is that the history of photography has been full of people who, with some sort of great intensity, put forward theories on the nature of photography, or who denigrated the work of others, or who set up breakaway groups to sort of change the face of how photography worked. These people, of course, have their place, but fortunately there were others who avoided controversy and who went about recording their time and their life uh, and the period in which they lived, either from a sense of mission or simply to leave an accurate vision of their life and times for others. Uh, and what's interesting is that on one hand, uh, we think of the documentary photographs we know from the era of Dorothea Lange and Migrant Mother to be objective. We think of them as being objective. But we have to remember that all photographs are subjective. They are the photographer's evaluations and interpretations of the world before his or her eye. The objective, realistic documentary style is representative of the, of the photographer's own subjectivity. So when we looked at that set of images that Lang made on her way to making this picture, we recognized that there was an editorial process in her, in her work that changed the way we see Florence Thompson and her children, that the other pictures did not have that same kind of powerful, gut-wrenching, uh, factual material that this picture has. So we always have to remember that there is a subjectivity even to the most apparently pure documentary images. Walker Evans, another one of the FSA photographers, and here's a quote from Evans. Don't try to write this down because it's a kind of a weird quote, but just sort of listen to what he's saying. Evans said, the serious seasoned photographer knows that his work can and must contain four basic qualities, basic to the special medium of camera lens, chemical, and paper. Camera lens, chemical, and paper. And he said that those four things, he goes on to say these four things are, one, absolute fidelity to the medium itself. That is, frill and frank and pure utilization of the camera as the great, the incredible instrument of symbolic actuality that it is. So he says the first and foremost thing you have to do is be faithful to the medium and understand that the camera uh, is an instrument of symbolic actuality. And he says, too, that the next thing you have to do as a photographer is complete realization of natural, uncontrived lighting. He didn't want his pictures to look lit. And he said that the third thing was rightness of in-camera viewfinding or framing. And then he parentheses, parenthetically says, the operator's correct and crucial definition of his picture borders. You noticing some similarities to what Zarkowski had to say last week? You know, what we choose to photograph, what we choose to put in the frame. Um, and then the fourth thing that uh, Evan says is general but unobtrusive technical mastery. General but unobtrusive technical mastery. Evans went on to say, photography seems to be the most literary of all of the graphic arts. Photography will have on occasion, and in effect, qualities of eloquence, 
wit, grace, economy, style, of course, structure and coherence, paradox and play, and oxymoron. All of those things uh, will, will be part of photography, he says. Another uh, FSA photographer that we've sort of passed by, and you may remember looking at this left-hand picture uh, way long ago at the beginning of the semester, uh, Arthur Rothstein, uh, a career that included both the FSA, which we have here, also Look Magazine and Parade Magazine. He was also a founding member of the American Society of Media Photographers, ASMP, still a very important organization. Rothstein said, because powerful images are fixed in the mind more readily than words, the photographer needs no interpreter. A photograph means the same thing all over the world, and no translator is required. Photography is truly a universal language, transcending all boundaries of race, politics, and nationality. A universal language. So from a social conscience, we'll go to a social record, which I suppose in some ways has a, a component of social conscience. <coughs> Edward S. Curtis, the photographer, uh, created a body of work called The North American Indian. And it's one of the most significant, but also one of the most controversial representations of traditional American native culture that's ever been produced. It was issued in a limited edition of books, beautifully constructed books, from 1907 to 1930. And the publication continues to exert a major influence on the image of Indians in popular culture. Curtis said that he wanted to document, quote, the old time Indian, his dress, his ceremonies, his life, and manners. These books contained over 2,000 photographic plates and also narrative. And in them, Curtis portrayed the traditional customs and life ways of 80, 80 Indian tribes. 20 volumes, each with an accompanying portfolio of images, are organized by tribes and culture areas encompassing the Great Plains, the Great Basin, the Plateau region, the Southwest, California, the Pacific Northwest, and Alaska. So he literally covered the country trying to explore culture and life of the Native American. So uh, this project, again, issued in a limited edition, sold expensively on a subscription basis, contained millions of words, descriptions of homelands, accounts of religious beliefs that some might find strange, accounts of tribal organizations ranging from the aristocratic to the casually democratic, records of ceremonies so subtle in their significance or seemingly so bizarre that an alien eyewitness could not understand what it all meant, versions of haunting myths, stories, songs, descriptions of domestic chores, intricate and skilled arts, hunting practices, heroic tales of arms and men. In short, this project is a monument in words and pictures to a range of cultures which most white men could not or would not see. Curtis started the project out of an altruistic desire to portray what he felt was the real North American Indian. But he had a couple of problems. One was funding. Eventually he ran out of money to be able to continually research and write all of this stuff and make all of these photographs. Then President uh, Theodore Roosevelt liked what he was doing and wrote him a letter in 1905 and said, I regard the work you do as one of the most valuable works which any American could now do, 1905. Um, in the end, the financier J. Pierpont Morgan, who we remember seeing a photograph of sometime during the semester, capitalized Curtis, uh, and Curtis then sold <coughs> subscriptions to this project and eventually got the project completed. Yes. Are those dates wrong, or is that just the social record? That's just when he did it. That's when he did it. Not his. Not his life dates. Okay. Okay. The project. The project is 1907 to 1930. Father, you just said 1905. Yeah. Yeah. He'd be. Uh, uh, he. The project wasn't published until 1907. All right. So. All right. Uh, oops. I didn't want to go that far. So we'll go back here really quickly. So here's the dilemma. The dilemma that Curtis had not only was funding. But there was this secondary dilemma that he had. And the secondary dilemma that he had was 
that some of the Native American cultures weren't as visually interesting as others. And so what he discovered was that if he was photographing a tribe that didn't have particularly elaborate clothing or headdresses or ceremonies, he kind of borrowed from some other cultures, some other Indian tribes. And so what appears to be a very objective recording of these native tribes' uh, lifestyles sometimes makes, takes some liberties with them as well. Partly, of course, to make sure that this body of work sold, right? So very interesting, right? So it's, it's both a sort of a massive undertaking and also one that has a great deal of subjectivity to it at the same time. So on one level, it's an amazing record. On another level, it's sort of an editorialized record. All right, so moving on to this guy, E.J. Belloc. Belloc was a commercial photographer of French Creole extraction who worked in New Orleans in the first decades of uh, the 1900s. Very little of his commercial work survives, but Belloc also had a secret life. In 1958, after his death, a collection of nearly 100 glass plates, negative images, were discovered in a drawer of his desk. The plates, dated from about 1912, were portraits of New Orleans prostitutes photographed in Storyville, the city's red light district. The negatives were eventually acquired and printed by the photographer Lee Friedlander and comprised Belloc's only known work other than a series of photographs for a World War I shipbuilding company. It's the only other photographs we have surviving by Belloc. And I suppose, it's possible that the photographs may have been made for a commercial assignment. It seems fairly unlikely, because they have about them a variety of conception and a sense of leisure in the making that defines them as a work done for love. Our subject from last week, John Zarkowski, said, a good photographic portrait is the result of a successful collaboration between the photographer and the sitter. The remarkable individuality of Belloc's portraits is the individuality of his subjects. With Belloc's help, these women have realized themselves in pictures. So it is a documentary photo project, no doubt about it, but one that is very personal, and one that Belloc obviously did not want to have out in the public eye because the photographs didn't, weren't known to the public until after his death. Uh, so really interesting body of work. Another uh, uh, talking about social record, another social record photographer to look at here uh, is August Sander, a German photographer working between the world wars. Uh, and he produced a project called Man of the 20th Century. Uh, it was Sander's monumental, lifelong project to document the people of his native Westerwald, which is near Cologne in Germany. So uh, Sander said, from days of old, and in all periods, we can find documents and books with pictures illustrating them. But photography has presented us with new possibilities and new tasks. It can depict things in magnificent beauty, but also in terrible truth. And it can deceive enormously. We must be able to bear seeing the truth. But above all, we should hand down the truth to our fellow human beings and to posterity, be it favorable to us or unfavorable. Sander photographed people from all walks of life and created a typological catalog of more than 600 photographs of the German people. The Nazis banned his portraits in the 1930s because the subjects did not adhere to the ideal Aryan type, but Sander continued to make photographs nevertheless and uh, uh, made, ended up finishing the project to his satisfaction. So, uh, and that uncompromising directness of Sander's portraits continues to influence artists today. And you'll notice that many of the sort of uh, social documentary portraits being made now uh, affect this same kind of look and feel in a lot of ways. So, uh, Sander, a very important documentary photographer. The eccentric photographer known as Dis Farmer born in 1844, died in 1959, seemed to be a man determined to shroud himself in mystery. He was born Mike Myers 
but he rejected the Arkansas farming world uh, and the family that raised him. He didn't like them. He didn't like living in Arkansas. He didn't like being the son of farmers. So he was not a farmer. He was a disfarmer. <laughs> changed his name. So Mike Disfarmer uh, changes his name. And he taught himself how to make and develop photographs and set up a little studio on the back porch of his mother's house in Heber Springs, Arkansas, followed shortly after that by uh, a studio uh, that he built on the main street of Heber Springs. And he began making photographs of people who came by his studio. He was, in fact, a local studio photographer. He used commercially available dry glass plates, photographed subjects in direct north light, creating a unique and compelling intimacy. The photographs are always shot in the same kind of lighting, uh, and yet, even though the same lighting was always employed, people said that he was obsessed with making sure that the light was falling on people's faces correctly, uh, and sometimes would take over an hour to set up a portrait uh, before he made the photograph. He had a reclusive personality, and he also had a kind of innate belief in his own unique superiority, both as a photographer and also as a human being. And it made him somewhat as an, uh, of an oddity to others in town. Uh, but having your picture taken at Disfarmer's studio became one of the main attractions of a trip into town. Lost to history until the 1970s, Disfarmer's photographs became uh, uh, discovered and published in the middle of the 1970s, at which time the New Yorker magazine said, the Michael Disfarmer pictures of the citizens of rural Arkansas in the 1940s are spellbinding, in part because they are so immaculately free of glamour. And the New York Times said, an outstanding discovery. Dis Farmer's photographs can stand comparison with the works of August Sander, Deanne Arbus, and Irving Penn. So suggesting that his photographs of the everyman uh, kind of transcended something uh, and recorded a particular time period and place. Born in Brooklyn, New York in 1914, O. Winston Link fell in love with steam railroads while he was a teenager, and he photographed them sporadically over the next 25 years. His interest in steam railroads became an obsession in 1955 when he got an assignment for an advertising agency in Virginia to photograph the steam railroads until they petered out in the early 1960s. And it wasn't only the trains, but he also became fascinated by people's interaction with trains as they went past where people lived and worked and played. He photographed mostly at night so that he could control the light. And he spent hours setting up synchronized flash systems of his own design so he could stop the motion of a speeding train. Flash systems that used flash bulbs, not electronic flash. Flash bulbs, a technology now sort of lost to history, some of us may remember it from our childhoods, uh, but flash bulbs emitting a single brilliant burst of light that then has to be replaced. So you have to go back and take the light bulb out, the flash bulb out, because it's been used, put a new one in. And so you can actually see Link's flash equipment here. There's one, there's another one, lighting up the train as it come by, came by. He planned out his pictures very carefully. He photographed with a 4x5 camera, permitted only one sheet of film to be shot at a given time. Uh, and uh, and you know, if he got it wrong, he had to wait for the next train. And he also had to go and redo all of the flash bulbs of the hundreds or perhaps thousands of flash bulbs that he was using. So uh, these pictures are extraordinarily carefully planned. And what's interesting is that they're not just photographs of the trains, but he sort of took, took a, a tremendous amount of effort to photograph the way in which people's lives interacted with the trains. Do you have a question, Andy? Yeah. How did he get all the flash bulbs to go off? Lots of wire. Really? Lots of wire, yeah. Lots of wire and a little, uh, and we'll actually see a, a, a picture of some of it here in a second. Uh, some equipment that he made to link them all together so that he had one box that went to the, to the sync connection on his camera. So this result of a boyhood passion is a body of work 
that freezes a specific time period uh, in America, a time when drive-in movies and riverbeds and small town main streets and front porches were places of quiet entertainment. In addition to recording uh, the image of the trains, Link also recorded sound. So uh, here he is on the left with the recording equipment, uh, recording the, what this train sounds like. And here he is on the right. This is Link on the left and as an assistant here on the right. And he built some of these flash uh, uh, pieces because there wasn't anything big enough to light up some of the things that he needed to light up. So are those multiple bulbs? In yeah, so each one of those is a bulb and a big giant parabolic reflector. See the boxes of bulbs? Yeah, giant boxes of, light, of flash bulbs. But one thing you can do with those flash bulbs, if you break it, break the glass, stick it in there, you get a nice explosion. Exactly, because it's, it's an explosion inside of a piece of glass, essentially. So if you've ever turned on a light bulb and, you know, the light bulb goes poof, you know, this is like poof times 30. Uh, or in some of the cases, of some of the bulbs that, that he's dealing with, poof times a couple of hundred uh, in terms of intensity. So a more contemporary documentary photographer, Steve McCurry, has photographed for, among others, National Geographic, Time, Newsweek, Life magazines. He's published four books and been presented with numerous awards, including Magazine Photographer of the Year honors by the National Press Photographers Association. So in short, McCurry is one of the world's most respected photojournalists. Uh, and uh, as we take a look at some of his images, he says, basically I have an enormous curiosity about different cultures, countries, and ways of living. He has several elements to his powerful style. First is intimacy. He says, I look for the unguarded moment, the essential soul peeking out the experience etched on a person's face, and I try to convey what it is like to be that person. I don't like to work in bright light. I prefer overcast situations. Even at the end of the day, I like to work in shadow rather than that magic hour light. Of all the places he's traveled, he's most fascinated by the East and Far East. He said, I went to work on some stories in India, and it was kind of an arbitrary decision, but once I got there, I was astonished at how different and fascinating it was. The ancient culture, the way of life, the customs. I was transfixed, and I ended up spending two years on that first trip. So here's Steve McCurry, hopefully. I think that photography has uh, some impact on uh, social change and social consciousness. Probably not a lot, but um, I think that any contribution you can make, any positive co contribution, any kind of good karma you can create is a good thing. So even if it's just one brick in, in the wall of some, you know, something of value, uh, I think that's a good thing. So I, I think it does, uh, I'm not sure if photography ever really stopped the world war, but it probably had a positive effect. So I think, uh, I think it definitely can uh, I know this picture I took uh, of this Afghan refugee girl, uh, which ended up on the cover of National Geographic, uh, inspired a lot of people to come to aid of the Afghan refugees back in the middle 80s. So uh, I, I think that, you know, it may not be a huge um, contribution, but I think it's, so I, you know, I think it's significant. So he's talking there about whether photography can impact social change, and he says, He's not certain that photography completely impacts social change, but he says it can play uh, somewhat of a role. Uh, so uh, he's talking there about some of the photographs he made in Afghanistan, and uh, here is perhaps his most famous photograph published in uh, 1984. Uh, and uh, some of you will recall this photograph. It's probably one of the more widely published photographs of the last few decades. Uh, and certainly a very powerful image, and one that sort of brought a lot of uh, a, a lot of consciousness, as he even said in his little video snippet there, to the Afghan problem and and people coming to the aid of the the refugees. What's really interesting is that McCurry at some point uh, went back and uh, uh, found in 2002 the same uh, woman, uh, Sharbat Gula. Uh, who was oblivious to the fact that she had become a famous face, 
uh, and she now lives in a remote region of Afghanistan with her husband and her three daughters. So uh, really interesting that he had the kind of fortitude to go back and find this woman again and photograph her again. And in some ways, that represents another piece of the documentary puzzle, not only looking at the way things are, but looking at the way things change over time. Another photographer uh, who has been looking at that in a, in a significant way is Nicholas Nixon. Now, Nicholas Nixon we looked at a little bit before, uh, but uh, here he has been photographing the four Brown sisters each year since 1975. They're always in the same left to right orientation, and their images show the passage of time. Uh, there's more, though. It's not just the passage of time, but also the sense of closeness and the way in which their lives have continued to touch each other and change separately and together. Uh, sometimes the photographer's shadow falls over the women, adding to the family snapshot look of the image. So from left to right, they are uh, Heather, Mimi, Bibi, and Lori Brown. Nixon's wife is Bibi, the third one from the left. And they're always in the same orientation. What I've done here is I've just put these together so you can kind of see them chronologically. Um, and I won't talk much during this, but as, as you watch this chronological progression, sort of see what you can see. It's interesting, isn't it? You sort of see not only the progression of time and age, but you also, at least, at least I often, when I look at them, perceive uh, changes in not only their relationship, but perhaps changes in their health, changes in their uh, situations in life, that as portraits of four individual women who also are all together, uh, he, uh, he seems to capture something that goes beyond a portrait. So a documentary photography project of a different sort. Uh, and a different type. So um, uh, Nicholas Nixon's Brown Sisters. Concept as photograph, or conceptual photography. So I've actually left this topic to the end of our time because you, know, we, you may remember that it kind of came up at some point, partly because I, I feel like you kind of need all the background of where we've been to get to this particular spot. So uh, let's see if we can kind of look at conceptual photography, a type of photography that has uh, really uh, sort of been on top of what much of contemporary photography has been about. But uh, let's first look at uh, conceptual art and its origins and uh, see if we can kind of come up with some ideas about where conceptual art came from. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll sort of see where we, where we wind up with it. So, here is Alfred Stieglitz. And one of the things that you may remember that we saw about Stieglitz was his basic idea that the idea was more important than the mechanics. So here is uh, a quote from Stieglitz from 1899. Uh, and he said, in the infancy of photography, it was generally supposed that each succeeding step was purely mechanical, requiring little or no thought. The result of this was the inevitable one of stamping on every picture thus produced 
a brand of mechanism and crude stiffness and vulgarity. Uh, within the last few years, he goes on to say, photographic workers began to realize the great possibilities of the medium in which they worked. Lens, camera, plate, developing baths, printing processes, and the like are used by them simply as tools for the celebration of their ideas. Tools for the celebration of their ideas. So this quotation from 1899 from Stieglitz positions his view of photography as being distinctly different from the technical documentary images that had come before. In his mind, photographs could be more than documents. More than documents. And he's really saying that he said in the early years of photography, it was just you know the new technology that appeared that made things change. Now, he says, now that we kind of have an idea of how to use all this stuff, he says we use lens, camera, plate, developing bath printing processes simply as tools for the celebration of ideas. Tools for the celebration of ideas. So there's Stieglitz in 1899. And now let's take a look at uh, Marcel Duchamp, 1917. 1917. So this is a sculpture that Duchamp created called Fountain. He signed it, and this is actually a reproduction of it, but he signed it, R. Mutt, the date 1917. So what Duchamp does is he goes to the hardware store, he buys a urinal, he takes it to the art gallery, he signs it, R. Mutt, and he puts it on top of a pedestal in the art gallery. And in doing that, he creates something that he called a ready-made. A ready-made. And in his mind, the ready-made was art that existed simply because the artist declared the object to be art. For Duchamp, in looking at this particular sculptural piece, it was the context that changed the work from being a mundane urinal to art. Moving the urinal from the hardware store to the art gallery was merely a change in the context of how we viewed the object. And Duchamp says, in doing this, he's really asking a question. If I take any object from where it is and place it in the middle of an art gallery or museum, does that meaning of that object change for the viewer? All right? So he understands that it's a urinal. Everybody who's looking at it understands that it's a urinal. But it's merely the change in the context of where we see the urinal, not in line on a shelf at the hardware store, but rather the urinal now on a pedestal in an art gallery. It's not like he's saying, look at this incredible thing I made, but he's really asking us to ask a question about the origin of the art. Where does art come from? What do we do when we confront an art object? What is an art object? So there's Duchamp, 1917. And here's uh, Robert Rauschenberg, jumping forward quite a bit, 1953. Robert Rauschenberg's piece, Erased de Kooning Drawing. Erased de Kooning Drawing. So in 1953, Robert Rauschenberg exhibits this piece, Erased de Kooning Drawing, a drawing by the great modern artist Willem de Kooning, which Rauschenberg painstakingly erased with an eraser. And in doing this piece of art, Rauschenberg is asking fundamental questions about the nature of art. He's challenging the viewer to consider whether erasing another artist's work could be a creative act, as well as whether the work was only art because the famous Rauschenberg had done it. I've got here, just so you can see, this is a de Kooning drawing, so you can see it's actually a painting, I think, probably, but you can kind of see what it is that he erased, all right? So erased de Kooning drawing is Robert Rauschenberg's piece of art that is intended to ask a question about what art is. <coughs> is this art because it was a de Kooning drawing? Is it art because Rauschenberg erased the de Kooning drawing? Is it art simply because it's something by a famous artist named Rauschenberg that he puts on the wall. He's asking us to ask questions about not the art itself, but the nature of what art is. All right, you with me so far? Okay, so let's move forward a little bit 
in the 1960s, conceptual art hits a stride, especially in the eyes of this guy named Saul LeWitt, who wrote in 1967, and don't try to write this down, if you look for uh, you know, a conceptual art, uh, you know, like a basic manifesto conceptual art, here is Saul LeWitt's manifesto. And he says, in conceptual art, the idea or the concept is the most important aspect of the work. All planning and decisions are made beforehand, and the execution is a perfunctory affair. The idea becomes the machine that makes the art. The idea becomes the machine that makes the art. So the basic concept here is that last sentence. The idea becomes the machine that makes the art, but all planning and decisions are made beforehand. The execution of the art itself is simply just mechanical. All right? So this idea that's, that Saul LeWitt sort of articulates brings us to conceptual photography. Born out of the conceptual art movement of the 1960s, I put Saul Lewitt's quote back on this slide. Again, a wordy slide. I apologize when they're really wordy. But conceptual photography rejects the preciousness of either the creation or the appreciation of traditional art objects. Artistic production should serve artistic knowledge, says the conceptual photographer. The art object is not important. The idea is. The actual thing, you know, Joanne's was in here with her pieces, which are beautiful objects. Conceptual art takes the opposite direction and says, the object itself isn't important. The thing that made the object, the idea behind the object is important. All right? So let's see if we can kind of come up with an example here. Here's one. Eileen Cowan. In the mid-1970s, photography had moved solidly into the art world. And the bias against photography as an art was largely gone by the middle of the 1970s. And because of this, photography by artists began to join art photography. So another conceptual, another part of this conceptual photography movement is that not all photographs were being made by people who considered themselves photographers. Eileen Cowan is perhaps one of the more important ones of these people. And in what she's done in these pictures is explore the ways that we construct our world through narrative. Cowan says she's interested in the idea of storytelling. This is her quotation. I'm interested in the idea of storytelling, the nature of the narrative, and the relationship between fiction and nonfiction. The photographs that we see here are from her family docudrama series. They revolve around elaborately constructed scenes that have the look and feel of a low-budget soap opera. In making these pictures, she gets actors, sometimes her friends and family members, and takes and assigns them a specific role or a gesture in the scene or an emotion, sometimes all of those. But she doesn't want this strict planning to prevent the viewer from reading the photographs literally or metaphorically or personally. And so she doesn't want to tell a specific story in the pictures, but instead is encouraging viewers to interpret the scene in their own way, knowing that the meaning will change depending on their life experiences. So these pictures are not intended to be pictures that we think of as, oh look, there's a woman in a you know, mauve colored shirt looking at another woman in a blue colored robe with a guy asleep in the bed. More important is what's going on here? And what does this idea make me think about? All right? So wait a second. What do they mean? So what I want to do is show you five very short videos. Five very short videos where five conceptual artists using photography explain what they're up to. Here's one. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Okay. Perfect. I've got this sort of, I guess, love affair with the past. When I was a kid, I wanted to have been an ancient Greek. Uh, and uh, we're talking like five years old, six years old. I was fascinated with the Greek mythology. And, um, and oh, and I was 
passionately in love with the sculptures. You know, I'm from New York originally, the Metropolitan Museum, those pathetic broken people. <laughs> it's sort of like a mausoleum of cripples. When I was in high school, I used to play hooky and go to the Metropolitan and feel up the, um, you know, Perseus and all the uh, poor fellows. And um, sometimes a guard would catch me and say, don't do that. So that's Eleanor Anton talking about her project, The Last Days of Pompeii. We'll move on here, another one. You know, these guys don't react in the way they would ordinarily react to a situation where they meet a stranger. It's because of, of, of the circumstances and the eccentricity of it that it becomes, you, sh you, you sort of shortcut a lot of formality and it becomes very, very soon informal. And I don't just mean the fact that these guys spit food dye for hours. It is a very intimate experience because it's unusual and because you have to really give a part of yourself to do it. It's, it's, um, it's exhausting. While these two images formally or in terms of the process are similar, the emphasis is very different. And I usually wait for a moment that is that brings out some kind of vulnerability. And it usually, ha I, I, I never know when it happens. It just happens at some point. And there's this very personal connection there that happens. And that's what I'm after. It's this personal connection with somebody, some stranger in a way. So Oliver Herring gets strangers to drink and then spit food dye for hours and hours and hours, and then photographs the result of that. Not because it's the beauty of the image that results, but rather what it is that he gets from that experience of recording, as he said, that vulnerability. So here's another one. <laughs> Sorry. Ready? It became very interesting to register this time of standing quite still face to face with another person, like soul to soul, and revealing something that's not, you know, the surface stuff that we usually allow out to the world. The shape of the mouth is very much the same shape as the eye, and the image becomes almost like the pupil. But so to in, sometimes invert the location of one sense to another part of the body, those kind of dislocations or slippages is um, one way that we come to see something differently. So Anne Hamilton using her mouth as a pinhole camera's shutter and making photographs, pinhole photographs, with tiny little cameras that she actually puts in her mouth. And the experience is much more about the relationship that she establishes between her as the mouth camera and the subject. So here's another one. I don't know that there's any one thing that attracts me to water, you know. And of course, if you start to think about water, it just explodes because it's so rich and, and uh, it's kind of everything and uh, nothing. I almost feel like I rediscover water again and again and again. So it isn't me going out after water. I think water's come in after me. It's, it's really much more, I'm much more the, the, uh, the prey and not the predator in that relationship. The Thames has uh, the interesting fact attached to it that it is the urban river with the highest appeal to foreign suiciders. One of the points about shooting the Thames was, was the fact that its darkness was quite real that people were, in fact. It wasn't just a, a visual darkness, it was a psychological darkness, and it, it was an actual darkness, and people are drawn to it for that exit option. So Roni Horn, the project Some Thames, which is a permanent installation at the University of Akure, Akure I know you're Icelandic, in Iceland, consisting of 80 photographs of water dispersed through the university's public spaces, 
with the idea that it's echoing the ebb and flow of students and learning over time. Uh, and so you heard her talk about the photographs of water and about uh, what it is that they represent and that they are perhaps inherently beautiful, but that isn't their primary intention. And then lastly, Janine so Antonio. So it was sort of making the rope that made me come to the idea to learn to tie rope. I practice tight roping for about an hour a day. And after about a week, I started to feel like I'm now getting my balance. I started to notice that it wasn't that I was getting more balanced, but that I was getting more comfortable with being out of balance. Rather than getting nervous and overcompensating, I could just compensate enough, and I thought, I wish I could do that in my life. After going down many different avenues, I decided to make this work touch. And what I did is I went home to the Bahamas, to the beach that was directly in front of the house that I grew up in. It made sense for me to go back to this horizon I had looked at my whole life. I thought it would have much more tension if I could walk along the rope and as it dipped, that just for a moment, I would touch the horizon. So Janina and Tony touch a video installation piece where uh, she is walking on a tightrope and that tightrope is juxtaposed with the horizon line. So in all five of those examples, it's about the picture, but it's also about the idea. The picture is sort of the, the secondary concern. The idea is the primary concern. As Naomi Rosenblum puts it in our textbook, she says, conceptual photography regards the medium as a way to make statements about itself rather than about the ostensible subject before the lens. It's based on the belief that photographs are, in essence, uninflicted records of information rather than emotionally nuanced experiences or works of art. The photograph, some seem to be saying, is whatever the light reveals, the lens embraces, and the chemical substances make visible. It has little to do with ultimate truths. Change the position of the camera and another angle, just as truthful, will reveal itself. So conceptual photography, as Rosenblum says, regards the medium as a way to make statements about itself rather than about the subject in front of the lens. So when we deal with a photographer like Ken Josephson, whose photographs ask us questions about the nature of the photograph, the top left image clearly playing with our sense of what it is that exposure tells us about the subject of the photograph, that the light bulb could be changing in its intensity but so could photography be changing the way it records the light bulb. So all of these photographs, all three of these, are asking us to ask questions about the basic idea of what the photograph is. John Fall, working completely within the straightforward tradition of landscape photography, also creates work that defies the tradition of landscape photography. We can see these photographs as landscape or architectural images, yet they are not in another way. He uses our expectations of photographic truth to demonstrate how facts can be manufactured. So this is part of a body of work called Altered Landscapes, and each image is the result of painstaking work on the site to construct ingenious and often witty illusions of perspective. The monocular camera has compressed space to give the illusion that the rock in the background and the pegs in the foreground really lie in the same plane, or that the tape affixed to the walls and columns is actually in a single plane, when our conscious mind knows that it's not, but he's playing with the way in which we perceive photography to say something. 
The photographs themselves are visually interesting, but it's really the idea of how the camera sees and how it differs from the way the eye sees. Constructing a grid, when we know that the camera is pointing away and creating forced perspective, but his grid suggests otherwise. So he's ex ex sort of extrapolating some ideas about how photography works, what it is that we perceive, and how we perceive it. Andy Goldsworthy. Goldsworthy uses natural materials to create sculptural objects that are often ephemeral and transient, sculptures that contradict the permanence of art in its historical sense. So these are actually sculptural objects that he makes out into the world, taking little chunks of ice and breathing on them to be able to freeze them together in this sort of sphere-like object on the right, or breaking rocks and scoring them, arranging them in some way. And because of the mortality that's involved in the natural world, Goldsworthy uses the photograph as a form of documentation to capture the essence of his work. So in a way, the photographs are both documentary but also conceptual in nature. He says, each work grows, stays, and decays. Integral parts of a cycle which the photograph shows at its height marking the moment when the work is most alive. There is an intensity about a work at its peak that I hope is expressed in the image. Process and decay are implicit. I strive to make connections between what we call nature and what we call man-made. I like the relationship to the past life of a material, of one hand placed upon another. At its most successful, my touch looks into the heart of nature's. Most days, I don't even get close. These things are all part of a transient process that I can't understand unless my touch is also transient. Only in this way can the cycle remain unbroken and the process be complete. So these photographs are a documentation of the process that he has out in the natural world. But remember that as a sculptural object, it doesn't last either. And another conceptual photographer is Gregory Crudson. Crudson's carefully staged photographs concentrate on a tension between domesticity and nature. He employs large production crews, and we've looked at Crudson at least once before, and the characters in his elaborate con uh, constructions seem to act subconsciously as if under the spell of some sort of foreign or alien entity. Their unusual actions suggest a mysterious narrative involving supernatural contact of some sort. I'm very interested, Crutzen says, in creating tension. Tension between domesticity and nature, the normal and the paranormal, artifice and reality, or what's familiar and what's mysterious. We could call that an interest in the uncanny, the terrifying and the familiar. I intentionally ground all these mysterious or unknowable events within a recognizable and iconic situation, which is the domestic American landscape. I think that in a sense, there's something about photography in general, he says, that we could associate with memory or the past or childhood. I never literally made miniature trains or tableaus or anything, but there is something very childlike in the process of what I'm doing with photography. And then moving on here to Park Harrison, a husband and wife duo that take a combination of their two names and construct fantasies in the guise of environmental performances for their everyman, a man dressed in a black suit and starched white shirt who interacts with the Earth's landscape. They tap into their surreal imaginations and combine elaborate sets, which they might take months to create, and an impeccable sense of wit and irony to address issues about the Earth and about mankind's responsibility to heal the damage he's done to the landscape. And in their work, they demonstrate this ability to distill and look at complex environmental problems, failed technological systems. This everyman's tireless labor seems to suggest a larger metaphor for creative production and the work involved with communicating through objects and images. And they also utilize uh, historical images, as we can see in this idea of combining a 19th century photograph with the sort of notion of sewing up the earth. Laurie Simmons. 
I was drawn to photography by conceptual art, which I'd first encountered in the 1970s. It had never occurred to me to pick up a camera before that. I'd had my art, my art education. I'd studied to be a painter, a sculptor, and a printmaker. My work is a decision not to deal with reality, with day-to-day -day reality. I didn't want to go out on the street with my camera or be a photojournalist or wait for the decisive moment. To have a subject matter I could control seemed to represent everything that photography wasn't. I wanted to make pictures that were psychological, political, and subversive. Images from my subconscious that could inform. I wanted to deal with subject matter, but I wanted to deal with it on my own terms. I'm not interested in visual, magical realism. Given a chance, I'll always go for accurate perspective and scale in the hopes that someone might believe the scene. There's always a mood that you project onto a human face. In a sense, the face of a doll is far more open than a face of a human. It's not possible for a human to sit in serious states of repose. People are either happy or sad or pensive or simply inscrutable. Whereas a doll has one expression you don't question. It's the doll's face. And then Sandy Scogland, a sculptor and installation artist who is also a photographer. Her work is intended to be both sculpture and photograph. Scoglin takes months to set up room size installations, which she furnishes with a few familiar objects, mostly modeled from clay, then painted and repeated until they overflow the space. The final step, then, is photographing the installation with people in it. The difference between the installation and the photograph, which is the real end result, is that the photographs usually contain people. She says that her work is based on a Frankensteinian model where the human beings have created a world that is out of control and turns on them. Again, it's the idea more than the picture. We might look at the picture and say, wow, that's visually very interesting. But it's the underlying idea in all of this that's, that's uh, where these come from. Tokuhiro Sato calls his photographs photorespirations. It's a title that refers to the process of breathing, but also the title, the title refers to the passage of time. His uh, training and background is in sculpture, but he thinks of himself as a photographer. What Sato does is he sets up a camera for an extraordinarily long exposure, sometimes half an hour, sometimes multiple hours. So he figures out some combination of filters over the camera's lens, really slow materials, uh, and a very small aperture to allow a very long exposure. And then he goes into the scene holding a small, in this case, handheld mirror, which he uses to then reflect sunlight back into the camera's lens. He either uses a small handheld mirror or, when he photographs at night, a small flashlight that he uses to draw thousands of little lines of light as he moves through the scene. The photographs then represent his movement through the scene without showing us him. So either a mirror or a small flashlight recording his movement through the scene regardless of the fact that we don't see him. We only see the sort of presence of where he would have been. Tokuhiro Sato. Abelardo Morel. Morel goes back to the origins of photography, turning a room into a camera obscura and then making photographs of what is created by his camera with a large format camera using exposures up to eight hours long. The result of it is a mix of the room he's in and what's outside of it. And he's beginning to play with this idea of what photography is. These images, he says, provide continued pleasure, energy, and surprise for me. I'm convinced that this is due in large part to the way these photographs are tied up with the excitement I felt during my own beginnings in photography, a time for me when the world I photographed seemed charged with new possibilities, strangeness, and hope. So it's a return to the roots of the medium, but also playing with the way the medium sees things. We are the camera. The photographs are simultaneously very simple and also very complex. I'm trying to remember who did 
Pharrell for their final project. I thought, I thought it was you, but I wasn't positive. So they were terrific, really terrific, really well done. This one's one of my favorite ones uh, because it is uh, a camera obscura built in, a, in an office, and on the wall of the office is an Edward Moybridge motion study picture. So there's some kind of really interesting stuff uh, happening. Uh, both in terms of the break and scale and also in terms of the sort of references to what photography is. Jeff Wall. The work of Jeff Wall has overturned nearly every convention of photography. Wall creates photographs that demand equal status with paintings, uh, and they do that in part by sheer size because they measure in feet, not in inches. He produces them as unique objects and not additions. So a Jeff Wall picture is, like a painting, a singular object that does not exist in multiple uh, versions. Uh, so Jeff Wall uh, produces these enormous images, usually presented in light boxes hung on the wall. And uh, he thinks of these pictures not as photographic images so much, but rather as ways to convey certain ideas about art and depict subject matter with references to examples from the history of art. So here is this, but then you know, here's where he's coming up with inspiration, Manet's Olympia. So this piece that we see here is one part of a two-part piece. You can see for a sense of scale here, an installation view. And the, 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 the piece is called Stereo. And here's Jeff Wall talking about Stereo. But in Stereo, I was interested in loneliness, solitude, um, the fact that people could listen to music, which is something that seems to be a space-filling public art but they could have it brought into them privately by this, by this uh, technical device, the earphones, so that music could serve to isolate people even more into their own thoughts or into their own space or whatever they were involved in, rather than bringing them together. And that notion of isolation seemed to me to be a good one for a new, for a good one to, to express the nude, or to work with a nude, a nude male, which is a, a subject I've done twice only. And you have both pictures. That last phrase, the last statement, you have both pictures, he's speaking at an exhibition of his work, and both of the male nudes that he's done are in this exhibition. So, uh, so Jeff Wall working with ideas about art rather than about photographs themselves. Jason Salavon, this body of work that we're looking at is called These Are the Moments of Your Life. Salavon is not really a photographer, at least not in the way we traditionally think of photographers acting, setting up a camera in front of something interesting and making a photograph for posterity. Salavon instead works with the idea of how we use photography and what photography is to us as a culture. He does this by finding and then averaging together 100 images of a familiar, easy-to-understand subject. 100 Santas, 100 Little Leaguers. And he uses custom-designed software to put together these ideas that are uh, taking and regenerating and reconfiguring masses of communal material to present new perspectives on the familiar. So it reflects a natural attraction to pop culture, the day-to-day. -day. His work regularly incorporates the use of common references and source material, things that are common to our culture and our society. The final compositions are exhibited as art objects, as printed things, uh, while others exist in real time in software context, and you only see them at any given moment of their creation. And the interesting thing for me about these images and others like them, this is not an uncommon idea in contemporary photography, 
is how they suggest that photography is ultimately a banal exercise. With Sullivan's pictures, it's as if we don't need to see another kid on Santa's lap uh, or another little leaguer picture. Or in this case, anybody know what these, any figure of these? Specifically, anybody? Women. Women, nudes. Nude. You're right. <laughs> so they are Playboy centerfolds uh, from the 2000s, from the right, the 90s, the 80s, and the 70s. You're quite All each decade combined. So conceptual photography, documentary photography, hopefully you saw that there are some similarities between those um, uh, two different media. And I will say that, you know, if you're still sort of scratching your head about conceptual photography, uh, you're not alone. Uh, but if you basically understand that so much of what photography is about uh, now has to do with the idea rather than the image. The idea rather than the image. So, I do want to sort of wrap things up a little bit and see if we can kind of come up with some way of taking all of what we've taken in over the last 15 weeks and kind of packaging it in some way, uh, tying it up with a bow. And uh, I'm going to start out uh, with a slightly self-serving uh, but a, a personal note that I think you'll, you'll sort of see uh, has some, some relevance here. So. My father, William Paul Curto, had a career in business, but he loved photographs and he took lots of pictures during his lifetime. He used a wonderful Exacta camera that he'd gotten in Germany during World War II. I still remember the magical clunking sound it made when the shutter opened and closed. Of course, being a parent, he took a lot of photographs of me as I was growing up. Most of them were the standard family snapshots of me and my brother doing things that children do. I learned to walk by pushing that little rocking chair around the house. There are pictures of me with my older brother, Jim, and even a picture of a proud new bicycle owner. You have to love my mom's contribution of the matching red jacket and socks. My dad always encouraged my interest in photography. He built me a dark room in the basement of our house and always wanted me to follow the path of what would make me happy in life. Of all of the pictures my dad ever made of me, there are a few that have stood out for me for a number of reasons. This is one of them. I was, what, six or seven at the time. It appears as though I am checking out the interior of a new car, probably one belonging to my Uncle Jack, who always seemed to have a new vehicle. That's him coming into view on the left. There's something more, though, something about the way that my and my uncle's expressions and the coincidence of my uncle's face and my arm, and the moment that my father chose to make the picture that combined to make something that is pure and a remarkably complete photographic image. It combines moment, camera position, and subject in an interesting way. I love this picture. I love it because my father took it, of course, but also because of what a great photograph it is because my dad understood that there was a photograph in that moment. Because my father was always the one taking the pictures, there aren't many photographs of him in our family archives, even after I became a photographer. This is a picture I took of my dad in 1986, a little more than a year before he died. I remember him this way, handsome, confident, and with a gentle face that betrayed his kind and tender-hearted character. Looking back, I wish I had fewer photographs of places and things, and more photographs like this one of my dad. So, oh, thank, thank you. That's my 1250. <laughs> so um, a quotation from the photographer and novelist and essayist Wright Morris. Let us imagine a tourist from Rome on a conducted tour of the provinces who takes snapshots of the swarming, unruly mob at Golgotha, where two thieves and a rabble rouser are nailed to crosses. The air is choked with the dust and smoke of campfires 
Flames glint on the helmets and spears of the soldiers. The effect is dramatic, one that a photographer would hate to miss. The light is bad, though, and the foreground is blurred, and too much is made of the tilted crosses. But time has been arrested, and an image recorded that might have diverted the fiction of history. Morris goes on to say, what we all want is a piece of the true cross. However faded and disfigured, this moment of arrested time authenticates for us time's existence. Not the ruin of time, nor the crowded tombs of time, but the eternal present in time's every moment. From this continuous film of time, the camera snips the living tissue. So that's how it was. Along with the distortions and the illusions and the lies, there is a specimen of truth. That picture was not taken, nor do we have one of the flood or the crowded ark or of Adam and Eve leaving the Garden of Eden, or the Tower of Babel, or the beauty of Helen, or the fall of Troy, or the sacking of Rome, or the landscape strewn with the debris of history. Right, Morris. Perhaps the hardest thing for me to get across to you all uh, during this course was that in December of 1838, there were no photographs, no advertisements, no billboards, no babies on bare rugs, no photographs at all. And the reason that it's been difficult for, for that piece of information to get across is that all of us were born into a world populated by literally billions of photographic images. We live with photography every day. We use photography all the time, whether or not we are photographers. Since the advent of photography, our world has continued to diminish in size. The airplane and the camera and the television and the internet have rendered the exotic very nearly obsolete. If we haven't actually been to Egypt or the Grand Canyon or Rome, we've certainly seen enough photographs and movies and TV programs that we may as well have. And because of this, we have a hard time mustering a sense of awe, that sense of awe that Francis Frith might have felt with the pyramids or that Carlton Watkins certainly did with Yosemite Valley. We've been iPhoned and liked into submission and into complacency in the face of the beauties of the world. And yet, we're still compelled to photograph what we see when we travel to it. And that's just places, not people. The first photographs made of all of you were certainly shown to you, most likely accompanied by some sort of baby gibberish, like, who's that in the picture? Baby in the picture. We were probably unimpressed, being more concerned with questions like, why is it so cold? with all this bright light, when's lunch? However, as we grew older, our parents continued to take our pictures and show them to us. And as we did look at those pictures, and they continued to make them, we gradually began to equate self with photograph. And sooner or later, the distinction became non-existent. The photograph was us. We were the photograph. Again, we were probably unimpressed because photographs of us or of anything else, for that matter, were just part of the experience of living in the world. But imagine, if you will, the orphan child about whom no one cared sufficiently to record her for that affirmation of self. Or think about the wonder of a 40-year-old man in 1839 when he was confronted with his first photograph. He saw details he did not realize were there. He saw himself and his world anew. He was probably impressed. Imagine still further that that, say, 40-year-old man's first experience with a photograph was with a picture of himself. His first reaction may have been, do I really look like that? But upon deeper contemplation, he may have come upon one of the essential dualities in photography. Is it me, or is it just a copy of me? Am I nothing more than skin and bones? Is part of me missing? This time, I think he was probably awestruck. Photography is one of the greatest expressive media in the history of the world. And perhaps because of its dependence upon an originating object, what we might call subject, it's the most confounding. The deeper realities and questions of existence that our 40-year-old Victorian-era man finds himself confronting are the same basic questions posed by Aristotle, Plato, Dante, Machiavelli, Fitzgerald. 
the real difference for our Victorian man was for the first time in the history of the world that instead of confronting a sort of metaphor for the everyman, he was confronting an image of a real man himself. As you've no doubt ascertained, my background is uh, primarily in art. And photographs made for the purpose of making beautiful images and exploring man's relationship with worldly and other worldly forces are the things that interest me the most. And my bias toward photography that has uh, no overt commercial purpose uh, has probably biased this course, although hopefully not too much. I only point this out because we always have to remember where our information comes from. So if a commercial portraitist or a wedding photographer or a photojournalist or a photographer of architectural interiors and exteriors had been standing in this spot all these many last weeks, uh, the facts would have been covered, but perhaps with a different spin, a different emphasis. I suppose the good news is that I actually have done all of those things, so I've attempted to bring at least a little bit of that spin along for the ride. And as we've seen, photography and commerce have been tied together since almost the very beginning. Photography's continued commercial importance has been one of its most important facets, especially since that path led us to the commercial media of motion pictures and television and now the internet. But one of our main sources for imagery up here on the screen and in your papers and in your research has been the art museum. Most of the photographs that we've looked at up here are studied and avowed as masterpieces of the art of the medium, prized for their beauty as well as for their place in history. We have to remember, though, that all those pictures we've looked at on screen are just uh, the tip of a really big iceberg. And those images don't actually determine the reason for the medium's assimilation into our culture. The substantial number of anonymous images made since 1839 suggests that when we look at the work of the masters, as we have these past 15 weeks, we're only looking at a tiny part of the overall body of photography knowledge. A great masterpiece of photography may be concealed in a shoebox in your grandmother's attic, and it's up to you to figure out how to resurrect that to its rightful place. And as we've seen some photographs become resurrected from attics and shoeboxes and shown on our screen this semester, that rightful place may be a, an art gallery or a museum. But more likely it's going to be your living room wall or the top of your dresser. Because as we've discovered, most photographs are only as important as the sensitivity and sense of history that you bring to them whether that photograph was taken of your father or by your father, will mean a lot more to you than it will to anyone else. And we have to remember that like Wright Morris suggested, photographs themselves are relics in very much the same sense that he suggested of being religious. They are traces of the actuality of a subject filled with the poignance of the loss of that subject. They are, as Morris suggested, Pieces of the true cross. Someone was there, someone saw, and someone cared enough to make a photograph. And the photograph remains to be seen. Another important thing to remember about the photographs we've looked at this term is that they do, in fact, remain to be seen. Our digital age has created a time when more photographs are being made than ever before in human history. A significant difference between now and back then is that very few of the images that we're making today are printed or saved in any kind of archival way. Your challenge as the writers of the next chapters of the history of photography is to make sure that the pictures that you and I and our contemporaries make are still around to look at 150 years from now and that we can examine the history of, as we've examined the history of what we've seen, others can examine the history of what we have seen as well. Because, as we've seen, as reverence or nostalgia surrounds their subjects, photographic images are invested with an unsuspected depth. And the meaning of every photograph undergoes an inexorable transformation from the moment of its making. The meaning of a photograph is both absolutely unstable and infinitely malleable. 
you and I can look at an Edward Weston vegetable study, you might see a, man, a metaphor for man's struggle with nature. I might see a salad. Since Weston frequently ate the subjects of his still life photographs, we'd both be right. Perhaps, though, if this course leaves you with anything, it leaves you with a better understanding of photography's place in the world, as well as a fuller grasp of the subsurface complexities of a medium that outwardly appears to be so incredibly simple. You press the button, we do the rest. And in spite of my suggestion at the start of the course that all of the world's subject matter was photographed within the first 30 years of the medium's existence, the possibilities in this medium remain endless. So our purpose here has been not only to discover how photography has come into being, but also what it meant to people 100 years ago, 150 years ago, but also what it means to us right now in our time. And hopefully you've begun to find some of the answers to some of those questions, but the rest of the answers lie buried in those trillions of photographs that have been made since January 7th of 1839. And to that, I just suggest you keep looking.